Very good. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for having me uh, here today. It's always good to be back in South Africa, even though virtually, uh, but I, I, I definitely uh, miss the country and it, uh, it has a lot in my heart. Uh, so today I'll be telling you about shocking new insights into classical Novi. And of course, what I will show today is a collaborative work with really a lot of people that I cannot fit on my introductory slide. So definitely this is not a solo work, it's a collaborative work. And starting with introduction, so what are Novi? Novi are stellar eruptions that occur in what we call cataclysmic variable systems. These are binary star systems consisting of a wide warp accreting material from Roche low filling companion via an accretion disk. So the material builds up on the surface of the white dwarf, increasing the pressure and density. And at a certain critical point, a thermonuclear runaway is triggered on the surface of the white dwarf, ejecting at least parts of the accreted envelope with velocities ranging between 500 and 5,000 kilometers per second. The emission from the remnant nuclear burning on the surface of the white dwarf diffused through the ejecta and peaks initially in the optical, then in the ultraviolet. And as the ejecta expand, they become optically thin to the nuclear remnant nuclear burning on the surface of the wide dwarf, which peaks in the super soft X-rays. When the party is over, the accretion resumes on the surface of the wide dwarf, building up for the following eruption. So in a nutshell, no way accrete, erupt, repeat. Uh, there are around 10 novae discovered per year in the galaxy, though we expect that the, the actual rate should be higher, but we, we miss maybe a lot of them due to dust and extension and distance, etc. And also confusing with uh, confusion with other, other transients. So uh, based on this picture, we expect that the light curve of a nova or the optical light curve of a nova would show a quick rise to a peak followed by relatively smooth decline. But nova don't like to behave. And we see diversity of optical light curves from long lasting peaks to flares and multiple maxima to cusp shapes, oscillations, and only a small fraction of nova show well-behaved well -behaved smooth declines. And actually this is my reaction. I look at this plot because I always wonder what is happening here. So Nova optical spectra are emission lines dominated and they typically show strong emission lines and broad emission lines of Balmer, iron two, oxygen, helium, and nitrogen. If you're wondering why we study these objects, of course, if you are interested in accretion and nuclear processes, these are the objects to study. Uh, Novae form dust, uh, they contribute to the dust in the galaxy. And now there's a lot of research going to understand how dust form around Novae and other explosive transients. Uh, uh, Novae are the main contributor to the lithium abundances in the galaxy. So thanks to Novae, we can use today our devices. Uh, some novae could potentially become type 1a supernovae via the single de de degenerate scenario. And there's also some new interest in novae that started in the past decade and I will be talking a lot about today. Now in summary, novae as we know them or as we knew them are stellar eruptions which luminosity is powered by thermal emission from a hot white dwarf. But this picture has been recently challenged by the Fermi gamma ray satellite detecting GEV gamma ray emission from several novae. And it was a shock. No, literally a shock because you need shocks to accelerate particles to relativistic speeds so they emit gamma rays. More precisely, uh, I'm referring to the diffusive shock acceleration mechanism or Fermi acceleration. So uh, if uh, ooh, the, the video is, is not behaving well, I will try to play it maybe here. Okay, Let's see. Ah, yeah, it's not, for some reason it's not playing well. So if we have a charged particle traveling through a shock wave from upstream to downstream, if it encounters a moving change in the magnetic field, this can reflect it back through the shock in the opposite direction at increased velocities. So 
And this is how the, the Fermi acceleration or diffusive shock acceleration work. And uh, this mechanism requires dense shocks and fast media. Well, nova ejecta are not that fast, but they are some of the densest in comparison to other astronomical events. Here I'm showing a comparison with astronomical transients or events that you might be familiar with. And we can see that uh, novae ejecta are really some of the densest. So the gamma ray emission mechanism is uh, for the, uh, that is responsible for, for the gamma ray emission is either leptonic. So we are talking about relativistic Bramish falling. So we have electron accelerated or inverse Compton, or it is hadronic. Uh, such as pion production mechanism where hadrons collide producing pion, which then decay emitting gamma rays. The high energy spectra of the novel that we have observed for, so far cannot rule out either of these mechanisms. So here I'm showing the gamma ray spectra of the NOVA from 2018, the high energy spectrum. And we see that both models uh, fit the data fairly okay. So the first NOVA discovered to emit in gamma rays in, was in 2010. It's called NOVA V407 Cygnus. And this NOVA was a bit special because the companion star in this system is a red giant, which means the circumbinary medium is rich with material from the wind of the evolved giant companion. Therefore, the shocks or the gamma ray emitting shocks were thought or suggested to occur between the nova ejecta and the dense circumbinary medium enriched by the weight of the mass losing giant companion. However, Fermi later detected GEV gamma rays from several classical novae. These are systems with main sequence dwarf secondaries and therefore no dense circumbinary media. So where the shocks are taking place? The current model suggested to explain the formation of shocks in novae predicts that the shocks are internal to the nova ejecta and occur at the interface of two air flows. An initial slow and dense ejection, possibly directed in the equatorial direction by the binary motion, followed by a faster wind, which slams into the slow ejection, creating gamma ray emitting shocks. Of course, if this wind is equatorially bound, it will travel faster in the polar direction or more freely in the polar direction. So it becomes like more of a biconical flow or bipolar flow. This scenario did not come from nothing. Uh, and it was mostly based on the radio images of a 2012 NOVA called G9591. The color images here are thermal emission from the ejecta while the black contour are synchrotron emission supposedly originating in the shocks. Early on, we see an unresolved blob. And then we start seeing two distinct blobs moving in a specific direction. Around two years after the eruption, the symmetry flips and now we have two blobs moving in the perpendicular direction. So what we think is happening here is that initially we cannot resolve the nova ejecta, it's still not very uh, spatially resolved. But later we start first resolving the faster bipolar flow, which is expanding at greater speeds, which means we can first resolve. Two years later, this faster bipolar flow had dissipated and now we can start to resolve the initial slower and dense flow. And this is where this picture came from. So the model, the current model predicts that the gas temperature at the location of the shock is around 10 to the power six, 10 to the power seven Kelvin, which means the shocks might radiate in the X-ray regime. But we do not see much X-rays early on. We see mainly optical and gamma ray, especially around the peak. Because we think that the X-rays are absorbed by the dense ejecta ahead of the shock, reprocessed into lower energies, 
So they escape in the optical and ultraviolet. The observed gamma ray luminosity of several novae so far is in the range of 10 to the power 35, 10 to the power 36 Earths per second, which is actually only around 1% of the total volumetric luminosity of the nova, of a nova. While this seems very small, it's actually an important figure because based on this ratio and based on the standard gamma ray emission mechanism, we expect that only a few percent or like 5% of the shock luminosity is used to accelerate particles to relativistic speeds. And only 20% of this 5% is emitted in Fermi light fast bands, meaning that only 1% of the shock luminosity is emitted in Fermi gamma rays. If we compare these two figures, we can assume that shocks could potentially power a substantial fraction of the volumetric luminosity of a nova or the total luminosity of a nova. So of course, shocks have been theorized to power the luminosity of other transients, such as type two and supernovae, stellar mergers, tidal disruption events, but direct observational evidence has been so far lacking. The first observation support for this model came in 2016 with a nova called Assassin 16M8, which optical light curve in blue on this plot and gamma ray light curve in black on the top panel were correlated. I know correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation, but there is no reason for the optical and gamma ray light curves of a nova to follow each other unless they share the same origin, which is presumably the shocks. Well, if Nova Assassin 16MA did not convince you, Nova Assassin 18FV or V906 Carina will convince you for sure. This Nova was discovered by Assassin, the old scout automated survey for supernovae in March, 2018. And it was a bright naked eye nova. This is actually a photograph of the nova where the arrow is pointing at. And we were very lucky with this nova because one of the satellites of the bright nanosatellite constellation, these are an array of CubeSats aimed at monitoring bright stars. And one of these satellites, by coincidence, was observing the same field of the nova when it erupted. Actually, it was monitoring this bright star next to the nova. And this coincidence led to one of the best sampled optical light curves for a nova to date, tracking the eruption from its start and showing multiple short lasting flares of the order of a couple of days and with an amplitude just shy of a magnitude. For a comparison, this is what the optical light curve of the same NOVA looks like from ground-based daily cadence observations. Okay, we have this very beautiful optical light curve, but what did Fermi see? Unfortunately, when the NOVA erupted, on the night of when the NOVA erupted, Fermi was put down or was not observing, not on the sky due to technical issues with its solar panel. But fortunately, when Fermi came back online around 23 days after the eruption, this is what we got. Again, the best sampled now gamma ray light curve for an over to date, showing multiple distinct flares correlated in time with their optical counterparts. And this is huge. The fact that these flares occur simultaneously in time in both bands means that they very likely share the same origin, which is presumably the shocks because we know that the gamma rays are coming from the shocks. And the fact that the luminosity of the nova doubled during these flares means that the shocks could indeed power a substantial fraction or radiate substantial fraction of the total volumetric luminosity of the nova. Because of how well sampled these two light curves are, we managed for the first time to measure a potential lag between the light curves, and we found that the optical might be leading the gamma rays by around five hours, which has the potential 
to confirm the predictions that some of the optical emission is indeed reprocessed X-rays. We also had new star X-ray observations at the same time with the optical and gamma ray flaring, where we detect faint hard X-ray emission originating from deeply embedded shock. So another, another uh, uh, evidence for shock. However, the observed X-ray luminosity was lower than the model predicts. And this could be due to absorption, again, or suppression by the gas around the shock. So the gas around the shock somehow stealing from the, from the, uh, from the heat capacity of the shocks. So this set of unprecedented space observations present us with the first direct observation evidence that shock could indeed power a substantial fraction of the luminosity of a stellar eruption. It also explains some of the weird features we see in Nova Light Curve and which we know now that might be originating in shock interactions. So we had press releases with all the collaborations. Here's a screenshot from the actual SAO press release. And there's another screenshot from the NASA press release where the discovery was featured on the front page of NASA. And this is a video also from the NASA press release from the Goddard team. And this is what we think is, has actually happened during the eruption. So again, the video is showing us these two colliding flow scenarios. But how were we sure about this? Like, uh, how did we reach this conclusion that there are also two colliding flows? Did we have any images like the radio images of the Nova I showed previously? Not really, we, don't, we didn't have any imaging, but we had almost daily cadence, high resolution spectroscopy from variety of telescopes, including SALT, the Southern African Large Telescope. So I'm showing here the evolution of the H alpha line profile. And initially, if we start from the top left, this is uh, six days after the eruption. So uh, around four days before the NOVA reached the peak. And we see this uh, B Cygni profiles with velocities of around few hundred kilometers per second. And as the NOVA reach peak, we suddenly see a broad emission emerging with velocities of more than 1,500 kilometers per second, while the pre-existing p signal profile is still superimposed on top of the broad emission. This indicates the presence of two physically distinct ejections, a slow and a fast one, with the fast one blowing from the inside of the slow one. And also this shows that high resolution optical spectroscopy is a very important tool to explore the ejection scenarios and mechanisms in NOVA. And of course, it is nothing new. Spectroscopy studies have been carried out for more than 80 years now since the days of spectroscopic, uh, 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 what was plates, since the days of spectroscopic plates and with people like Dean McLaughlin, Cecilia piney Gaposkin and all these like uh, heroes uh, or early, early pioneers. And most of these pioneering studies uh, reported the presence of multiple spectral components during the early days and weeks of NOVA eruptions. And uh, they associate these multiple components with uh, multiple shells possibly and, uh, and or multiple ejections. However, despite all of that, despite this rich history, there is still some debate in the field whether NOVA actually exhibit a single ballistic ejection of a clumpy ejecta, or it is multiple distinct ejections of multiple flows like I was uh, just showing you. So, uh, and also one other thing is that it was not clear, uh, clear if what we observed in the radio images of this NOVA from 2012, these two outflow scenario is actually universal to all NOVA. Maybe these are like some unique specific cases. 
So what we did in the first in the past few years is uh, we were leading efforts to try to observe novae as early as possible after they are discovered, and prefer preferably before they reach optical peak. Since novae rise to peak in a matter of few hours to a few days, it is a very challenging task. So we use very agile rapid response telescopes, particularly in the south, such as the Southern Afri African Large Telescope SALT and the SOAR telescope in Chile. And also we relied on rapid NOVA discovery reports from surveys like Assassin, which we are, uh, um, which we are a member of here at MSU. And as well as of course, the valuable contribution from citizen scientists and amateur astronomers. All this in the aim to try to obtain spectroscopic follow-up of, of NOVA as rapidly as possible. I want to open here just small windows and talk a little bit about the large program for transients on salt, which is led by David Buckley, and which is really achieving great results on all level of and all fields of transients, allowing high quality rapid follow up to a diversity of optical transients. And I assume most of you are, are already aware of this program, but if you are not, get in touch with David Buckley. I'm sure he'll be happy to have more collaborators on this program. So anyway, all these synergies that we're, uh, we use put, uh, led us to successfully observing a large number of novae before they reach optical peak. And we found an interesting trend in all of them. Here I'm showing a sample where first we see slow p signet profiles before peak. So this is the top panel for different novae. So these are Barman lines, either H alpha or H beta. And what I'm showing here is very similar to what I just described for Nova V906 car. So as I said, initially we have these uh, 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 slow uh, velocity P signal profiles. And later on we have broad emission emerging after peak with the P signal profile still superimposed on top of it. So again, we think that initially we have a slow dense flow manifesting as the pre-maximum p signet profile. So here the slow dense initial injection. And then at some point we have a faster, possibly radiation driven wind uh, emerging and manifesting as this broad emission. If the slow flow is equatorially directed, as I said, the wind would, would, wind would move more freely in the polar direction, but this is just an assumption. And of course, when these two flows collide, because the later faster wind is going to catch up with the slower one, of course, they're going to interact, they create shocks, which might emit gamma rays. The fact that we see this same spectral evolution in all the novae we observe indicate that the two flow scenarios is likely universal. So here's now we have like strong evidence that most of novae are actually exhibiting two physically distinct interactions. Now, some of you might be asking why the first component always appear around the optical peak. Well, maybe because the interaction between the fast and the slow, the shocks that are emitting gamma, gamma rays are also what driving the optical peak in Nove. We now have great deal of evidence that shocks could indeed power a large fraction of the optical emission in Nove. So it's not a while to suggest that the shocks, the outcome of the interaction between these multiple phases of mass loss is what driving the optical peak in this Nove. Actually, some Recent work by Oli Simonari in 2000, Oli Simonari et al. in 2017, showed that the optical light curves of some novae could actually be the combination of two light curves or two emission, more precisely emission from the fireball as the ejecta initially expand. And then the shock emission, which manifests as the main optical peak. This is of course reminiscent of the double peak light curves that we usually see in stellar mergers, which was theorized that it could be coming from shock interaction. And Novi now are providing us observational proofs on that. 
And also this proves that novae could be used as laboratories to understand shocks and other rarer and sometimes more distant events. And since novae are much more common, they offer us laboratories in our galactic backyard to study these possibilities almost hands-on. Now, given that we are uncertain about the X-ray signature of the shock, so we have been seeing X-rays from shocks, but they were a bit uh, uh, less luminous than we expect. We decided to survey the X-ray behavior of novae during the early days of the eruption. So my previous student, Alexa Gordon, who is now a graduate student at Northwestern University, analyzed the swift X-ray data of all gamma ray emitting novae for her undergrad thesis. And her results show that there is no X-ray detection by SWIFT during the gamma ray emission phase. And only after the gamma ray emission drops below Fermi detection limit, we start seeing hard X-rays lightly coming from the shocks as the ejecta expand and become more transparent to what's happening inside. So, so here on the plot, the orange rectangle are the gamma ray emission duration. Uh, all the black uh, bars are, are upper limits, so non-detection, and then blue are hard X-ray and, and, and red are softer X-rays. And we see that during the gamma ray emission, all novae show have upper limits or non-detection. With the expection of only one nova, which is V407 Cygnus, the first nova that was discovered to emit gamma rays, and it is the only nova in the sample with concurrent X-ray and gamma ray detection. So while this nova is showing hard X-ray, what I have to remember is that this nova is not a classical nova. This nova, unlike all the others, has a giant evolved secondary. So this exception supports the scenario where novae with giant companions produce shocks with external circumbinary media in comparison with novae with dwarf companions where shocks occur internal to the dense nova ejecta and therefore a lot of the X-rays is absorbed by the dense ejecta head of the shock. So what's for the future? Well, there's a lot of interest in the future of Novae. I cannot fit it all in this talk, but particularly in the era of space surveys, such as BRIGHT, TEST, and any, uh, any future space survey, we expect that more chance occurrences, like what happened for this Nova and Carina, v 906 car, to also happen in the future and be recorded uh, as they erupt, like NOVA, as they erupt by some space surveys monitoring in the sky. Particularly TESS, which is of course meant to, to observe exoplanets, but TESS has a relatively large cameras and is also continuously monitoring parts of the sky. And therefore it has a great potential to study NOVA. And so far, in the first three TESS cycles, three NOVA already erupted in fields monitored by TESS. Here I'm showing one example, which is a nova called Assassin 19 QV. And also it was discovered by Assassin in the direction of the small Magellanic cloud. The plot here shows the ground-based Assassin light curves, which seems fairly smooth light curve, nothing much happening. But that's what the test light curve looked like. Also it caught the nova from the start of the eruption. Very nice, well-observed uh, nova with, with tests and you see this high quality data. And also we can see a lot of features that are a bit unusual for us with variability of the order of a day and a few parts of a magnitude. We haven't seen something like this before in NOVA because of course we didn't have the, the instruments that can, can provide us with such light curves. And we are trying to explore these features and check if there's any relation to shocks or some physics that we're not aware of but 
there's a lot of potential in exploiting test data. And TESS is now uh, recording more and more novel in, in, in outbursts. And I think uh, we're, we're going to do a lot of great work with that. Uh, one other importance of test data is that they are also useful to derive orbital periods of NOVA and cataclysmic variables. So even if a NOVA was not caught during outburst or during eruption, even if this system has been observed like before or after the eruption, we have the potential of getting orbital periods, which are very important to learn about the properties of the system and the evolutionary stage of the secondary or the companion. So here's the test light curve in red of the very same famous NOVA V906 Carina, which ended up in test fields around one year after its eruption. And uh, after doing some time analysis, we managed to get the period of 1.6 hours from the test data, which we think is the orbital period of the system. So of course, there's a lot of now studies going about dust in Novae. We're trying to understand how Novae form dust. There's a lot of work done on that. There's a lot of work done on understanding how much lithium Novae produce and they are, if they are indeed the main producer of lithium in the galaxy. But as you can see, Novae are panochromatic sources and they emit in almost all wavelengths and they are really interesting in all wavelengths, but they can also be multi-messenger sources. Because if the gamma ray production uh, mechanism in Novae is hadronic, we could expect that Novae could become interesting targets for neutrino missions, for example, like X-Tube, which is an experiment in the South Pole aimed at detecting high energy neutrinos from astrophysical sources. And we at Michigan State are part of the X-Cube experiment. And I have tried with some of the uh, people in the ice cube team here to estimate if we could expect to get any neutrino detection from bright novae like V906 Carina. But it seems so far unlikely at this stage, but not hopeless yet. Nevertheless, this might become more feasible with generation with uh, new generation experiments like ice cube generation two which would be sensitive to lower energy and therefore we might be able to detect neutrinos from Novae. But even if we cannot detect neutrino yet from Novae, we can use them as laboratories again to constrain our knowledge of shocks in other more distant events that could be shock powered like type two and supernovae, type one ACSM, superluminous supernovae, and this is a very recent work led by Kay Fang from Caltech and other people from our theorist friends aimed at using NOVA observations to constrain neutrino and gamma ray emission from a variety of shock power transients to explore if these transients could be responsible for the cosmic neutrino background, this diffuse neutrino background observed by experiments like ice cube. So what we did is that we considered that all the transients I'm showing on this plot are 100% shock powered, which is not realistic of course, but a bit reasonable for the purpose of the analysis. And we use the particle acceleration efficiency from Novae observations because we usually detect gamma ray from Novae, but it's like rare to detect gamma ray from all these events. So we use the particle efficiency from NOVA observations to estimate the gamma ray and neutrino emission from all these transients. And we found that currently known classes of non-relativistic potentially shock power transients contribute at most a few percent of the total ice cube neutrino background. So to, to summarize, the recent detection of GEV gamma rays from Novae have revolutionized the field and provided us with direct observational evidence that shocks could power the, the luminosity of some optical transients. We now have mounting evidence that the ejection scenario in Novae is more complex and diverse than we thought. And finally, in addition to being very interesting and cool events, Novae are 
extremely valuable laboratories in our galactic backyard to understand more distant and exotic transient events, particularly now in the age of all sky surveys and time domain astronomy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Elias, uh, for the wonderful talk. Um, we can take some questions. Um, so if you have a question, you can raise your hand. OK, great. Uh, thank you for the great talk and beautiful results. Um, just a few qu questions. One is that, um, I, I mean, I'm very uh, interested in the shock nature. Uh, can you just summarize? Uh, I think you, you mentioned that there are kind of two ways of shocking, uh, sh kind of a shocking gas. And can you just summarize the major uh, uh, shock, uh, shock mechanism? Uh, I think that's pretty in the front. It looked like you have a torus and then you have another major shock along the polar angle, etc. Can you just summarize? Uh, which uh, I'm uh, unfamiliar with, but I'm unfamiliar, but uh, yeah, I think that's amazing. So, yeah, so, so we think there are probably one shock, which is the result of the interaction of these two outflows. So we have possibly two outflows, a slow one, initial slow one, and it is possibly directed in the equatorial direction by the binary motion. And mm -hmm. so and then we have later on, we don't know yet for sure what is driving this later wind. We think that there are some material falling back on the wide wharf, uh, leading to mm -hmm. more accretion and then some uh, radiation driven outflow, faster one, because now we have less ejecta. So they are moving at faster, faster speeds. And this would catch up with the slow ejection and they would slam into them and create the shocks. Why it's going in the polar direction? This is, we are not still very sure about that. We have some images that are showing these two like uh, blobs that they're moving in the opposite direction. Though, so we think there are some, some geometry here, but this is mainly because if like the first one is, is more dense in the equatorial direction, we expand that mm -hmm. the later one would be more equatorially bound in the equatorial direction. So it can move freely in the polar direction. So you have this like hourglass geometry. And this is just why we think that is going in the, in the in the polar direction. And this, when when as I said, when these two outflows interact, they will create the shocks. Now there are two possible potential gamma ray emission production mechanism, and this is true for shocks everywhere. And this either could be leptonic, so we have electrons accelerated emitted emitting gamma rays, or we have. Uh, we have hadronic scenarios where you have, for example, uh, the hadron, uh, the pion production mechanism, where you have a, we have an ad or hadron or an, or nuclei uh, accelerated within the shock. Then uh, once it escapes, it interacts with uh, uh, when once it's accelerated, it interacts with another atom or a photon, and during this interaction, it will create it will emit gamma ray. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see, I see. Okay, interesting. And for the le for the left panel, uh, I, I saw a lot of these panel with uh, bracket minus number, bracket plus number. What, what do they mean? Oh, this one. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, so then on top, the it's the day uh, relative to the peak, optical peak on the light curve. And of course, this is so here, like this observation is taking four days before the Nova reach peak. And the uh, one below it is taken three days after the Nova of each peak. So we see before peak, we always in all Nova, when we observe them before peak, they show this P signal profile with low velocities. And then when we get on them after peak, we see this broad emission. Sorry. We see okay, so you are emerging. And that's how we are considering that there are two. The two physically distinct flows. This is like there's no doubt about that. So we have this this one that is uh, this slow flow that is resulting in a, a slow p-signal profile, and then we have the faster wind, which is which is result manifesting at this broad emission. And the fact that the p-signal profile is still on top of the broad emission, it means that we have two distinct flows, and the fast one is actually blowing from the inside of the slow one. Okay, I see. And, and why there is a big absorption on the on the first panel of uh, upper panel? Yeah, so 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 the, the ejecta are optically fixed, so we definitely expect 
P signal profile like absorption. So these are absorptions from the ejector. So, so just consider it as you have like where your photosphere is. So you get absorption from in front of you and an emission from the from the other side of the of the, of the optical photosphere. Okay. So this okay, is absorption right. from the ejector. And actually, there is absorption in the other one as well. It's just too shallow compared to the emission. So we see, for example, absorption also because the, the objects are very optically thick. So we see absorption even with the broader component, but this absorption is a bit shallow compared to the emission. However, around peak, uh, before peak, the absorption is strong relative to the emission. Okay, interesting. Okay, uh, I think I would just ask another last question. So when you mentioned the neutrino background, um, mm -hmm. That sounds very interesting. So, but uh, I, I think this, uh, how, how can we distinguish them? Uh, I mean, I, I understand it because I'm a, I'm a pure cosmologist, by the way, I'm working mm -hmm. on the other extreme. So in cosmology mm -hmm. at the early universe, the neutrino decouple from the rest of the hot plasma mm -hmm. at very early time when the universe was around the BBN. So, so then neutrino mm -hmm. left as a background and therefore, mm -hmm. but its, temp uh, its temperature is slightly even below the uh, CMB temperature. I think your, in oh. your case, neutrino would be ejected at more kind of a nearby <coughs> object. So what would be the difference when we see them in ice cube? No, so, so, it, so, so like, the diffuse background in Fermi, the gamma ray background, also there's diffuse neutrino background that I still see uh, uh, all over the sky. And we were just wondering if this could be contributed by a large number of shock powered events, extra galactic event, I'm not talking about galactic events. So uh, supernovae all over uh, the, 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 the neighboring galaxies and other type of, of shock power transients. If all these are indeed shock powered and they are they have hadronic processes and they are emitting uh, neutrino. Would all of these uh, transients contribute a lot to the to the diffuse neutrino background? And uh, our even like we took extreme assumptions to check how much they would contribute to the diffuse neutrino background. It is only around few percent. So definitely there are something else going on that is contributing the diffuse neutrino background. Okay, I, I guess the uh, ice cube would just record the event rate, right? Uh, for for their detection, like um... no, they they, they 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 do they do detect also like some uh, like so so they have for example so they have a lot of co cosmic rays so so they are, so they detect neutrinos coming from distant events and then they they detect so so actually they, they what they are detecting is the Cherenkov radiation of course so so also when you have also cosmic rays hitting the, the, the atmosphere from, you cannot point the direction because cosmic rays are very, like when they arrive to Earth, they would be like, mm. uh, uh, you know, the, 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 like deviated by the, uh, by the, the circumgalactic and uh, magnetic field and the galactic magnetic field. So they will arrive from any direction. And also they contribute a lot of, to the, to the, to the muons that, that, that ice cube is, is detecting. So ice cube end up with a lot of like, background signal in addition to the, mm. to the, to the event. Yeah. Mm. But, but if you have a NOVA exposure, mm -hmm. uh, can you provide any direction information? Uh, it, it, it depends. So uh, with, with the current ice cube uh, uh, experiment or like this generation, it is difficult because ice cube is mostly sensitive at, at higher at higher energies and not at like lower energies like like in Norway. So uh, one thing that I like was the current ex like when we have gener ice cube generation two, they will extend it to like be more sensitive to lower energies. And yes, it is uh, would be possible to port certain direction when we get these neutrinos. And actually, so with cosmic rays, we cannot point to a certain. Uh, direction, but with, with neutrinos, yes. And it would be even better if the object is in the northern hemisphere because you have less uh, background muons compared to like the southern hemisphere. Because oh. the cannot go through Earth. But the other thing is that now ice cube has something like called deep core, which is like oh, some like, some, <laughs> like, uh, uh, like uh, tubes that are like in the inner part of the of the entire array and these tubes are can can be more uh, sensitive to lower energies 
and therefore are suitable to detecting uh, novae, but their positional accuracy is like uh, low, it's like 30 degrees on the sky. So we need to look for time coincidence more than positional coincidence. However, the entire array can get you accuracy of like one degree, which I know it sounds very small for like people who do optical astronomy, but one degree mm -hmm. is still good to like point towards some part of the sky. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the last question is, you show, the, uh, you show a list of, uh, of objects, I think in the early of uh, your slides, uh, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. with V some numbers and uh, can, can you replay that slide? Mm -hmm. uh, v, uh, capital V with some numbers and with another symbol. Yeah, I wonder. Well, yeah, is that your is that the cataloging rule in your field? What does it mean? So, uh, so v, v means variable star. So this is the usually the official uh, nomenclature used by IAU. And uh, I try to find where we have a lot of names with V. So this is an, an example. This is another example. So V is the variable yeah, variable star number in this constellation. So V nine five nine mon mean or V for example thirteen twenty four sco. It's the variable star number thirteen number one thousand three hundred twenty four in the constellation of Scorpius. So V339 Del is the variable star number th 339 in constellation of Delphini. This is how, how they are named. Oh, interesting. But in, in uh, sorry for my very long question, but in each of the constellation, wouldn't the background there will be that the galaxy would be would be very far away? And how do you I mean they, oh, no, they, so, they so, could so. So it's, everything is projected on celestial sphere, right? So it's the direction of the star we found in the const the direction of the con it's, it's in, it, it, it would be in one of the constellations, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, it is in the constellation of of I don't know, Carine, like V906 Carine. It's the variable star number 906, number 906 oh. that is discovered towards the direction of the constellation of Carine. Okay, okay, just okay, okay, I see. Okay, so that's all my questions. Thanks. So going back to the so you you've got uh, this this these two two flows going on. So I understand when you've got the the red giant star, you're going to have a lot of stuff floating around the star from its losing mass. But with the main sequence stars, mm -hmm. what what how how is that coming about? Is it so? It's just if you've got like accretion and stuff is is you know somehow building up a cloud around the star. How's that how's that working? No, so so yes, for for systems as giant uh, giant uh, companions, as you said, you have a denser binary medium. So uh, the shocks are at the so yeah for 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 systems with with to evolve secondaries, giant secondaries, you have this dense circumbinary medium. So we think that uh, the, there are shocks between the nova ejecta. And the floating material from the mass losing giant. So this this is clear. However, for system with with uh, like this one here, which have a main sequence companion or dwarf companion, so we do not expect like floating material. So we have low density circumbinary medium. As I said, the shocks are internal to the nova ejecta, so they are happening between several phases of mass loss during the eruption. So you have the first ejection during the eruption, but the eruption is not just one ejection, it's multiple ejections. So we always thought that novae are like, <laughs> and they eject everything, but apparently it's not. We have first ejection, and then there's some wind coming. And of course now there's not only these images are the only evidence for this, not only the optical spectroscopy, there are a lot of theory that yes, novae might be just, uh, that be more than one ejection. So, so the shocks are happening between the different ejection of the nova itself. That's why we call them internal shocks. So you have the first slow ejection apparently. So the, the, the envelope on the white dwarf puff up and probably the, the binary motion start to help the, uh, the, 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 the system expel this envelope and it goes in a certain direction, maybe in the equatorial direction. And then apparently some material can escape, some material could not, so they fall back, there's more accretion, and then this uh, somehow uh, create a wind, and this wind will like slam again 
into this uh, slower injection because it's going in faster velocity. So after a few days, it will catch up, slams in it and create these shocks. So the shocks here are happening between different phases of injection of the nova eruption itself. Okay, got it. Thanks. So it's like multiple things, it's not one multiple thing. Ejection. Multiple ejections. Multiple events. Right, right, right. 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 And there's some nova are even like more uh, exotic. So for example, the one I'm showing here, like sometimes they show these multiple maxima. So they like rise for 20 days and then they go down and then they rise again and they go down. And uh, actually I might have a very good uh, example about this and uh, some slides that I did not show. Uh, okay, so this is uh, in, in, a, in a paper from two years ago where we see like uh, the go Nova go to peak and then start to go down and then like 50 days later, it does another thing and another one. There's a lot of Nova that does this. And here we think it's not only like just these two, but there are more ejection happening. We still don't know why, but we have also evidence for that in the optical spectroscopy. Like we see one, we see this like general evolution where we have initially p signal profile and then broad emission. So we have the slow and then the fast twin, but then we see more absorption features at higher and higher velocities. And we think there are more of ejection, not only these first two that we see in all Nova, but also there are even multiple ones. And they create these like multiple maxima when they interact. So Nova are very, very complex apparently and not just as simple as, as people thought initially. Thanks everyone for joining and thanks Elias for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks.